Tonight's topic is hope, and that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. Um, I know a lot of us, that's a difficult thing for us to be thinking about right now. We are stuck at home in the middle of uh, this global pandemic that hasn't happened and since the Spanish flu 100 years ago after World War I. And it's, it's a difficult time. It's hard for us to really figure out what's going on. Most people alive today have not experienced anything like this ever in their lifetime, and everybody's having a hard time coping. Uh, maybe some of our younger people here are having a much easier time as you're completely out of school and you're enjoying it. But for a lot of us, it's hard. There's a lot of people out of work, myself included currently. Um, my wife is not able to do her job right now and get paid. She still has a job, but it's hard. It's hard for us financially and for a lot of people. We see the news every night talking about the increasing death toll and all the things that are going on around the world. It's really hard. So what do we do during this time? And where do we find peace in the midst of all of this? It's not an easy question, I'll admit. Well. I want to tell you a story in my own life real quick as we delve, before we delve into God's Word tonight. I have a cousin. Her name is Mandy. Mandy and Andy, right? Well, she's the closest thing I have to a sister. Um, I don't have any siblings. I'm an only child. And I have two cousins, one of which she is older than me, about 10 years older than me. But she grew up around the block from me. So she really was, in many ways, my older sister. And I really look up to her. I have always had. Well, thankfully... God willing, that I have had grown up in a Christian home. That means that I've had family who since a early age have been pointing me to Christ. And she has too. Her whole family, thankfully, are believers. That's not the case in a lot of families, and I don't take that for granted. Well, I love her very much, but for many, many years she chose to run from God. She did a lot of things that were some bad news. She really got into drugs and to a lot of drinking, a lot of partying, doing a lot of things that she knew she shouldn't be doing. She also became a very, very, very good liar. And most of the time we didn't know what she was doing or where she was. She was such a good liar that I remember at one point she had us all believing that she was working somewhere for months when it turns out she had never even applied for a job at this place. She had lost her car, and we thought it was stolen, only to find it later deserted that she had left it when it ran out of gas. She had stolen money from our family. She had burned a lot of bridges and really gotten to the point where she didn't have much of a relationship with our family at all. And it was very hard for me to see this in her because I prayed for her all the time as a young kid. I looked up to her. I cared a lot about her, and I just didn't understand why, God, is this happening? Why are you allowing this? And I really wanted to see her come back to Christ and come back to her family. Well, after a long time going, as she got a little bit older, she did try to reconnect with her family. And there was about a year span where we really felt like she was getting back on the right path. But it turned out she had been lying just a little bit again. And... One of the issues that she had run into, one, she had no money, she had no insurance, she was quite poor, we didn't really know it at the time, and in a bit of debt. Well, she had gotten sick. She had gotten an intestinal issue called diverticulitis, and if any of you guys are familiar with that, I know it's a big medical term there, but it's an intestinal issue where there are little pockets in your intestine that are catching things and they can get infected and it can cause, if not dealt with, some not only severe pain but ultimately to some extreme issues. Um, your intestines could actually uh, pop open and flood your in insides with bile and cause all kinds of problems. It's not a pretty picture. Well, uh, she didn't get help and she continued to have problems and she didn't tell anyone because she didn't have the insurance and she didn't want to pay for it. Well, it got so bad one night, she was crying out in pain and they had to take her to the hospital in an ambulance. And sadly, her intestines ruptured and she went into cardiac arrest and she was clinically dead for eight minutes. Now, most of you may not know much about that, but after just a few seconds of your heart stopping, your brain cells start to die. Um, to go that long and to not have your heart working or anything, you should be dead. But thankfully, the doctors didn't give up on her and they continued to try to resuscitate her. And they stabilized her, but 
she was left in a coma and she had to be put into the ICU. Well, the next morning we found out about all of this and my whole family, we rushed up to the hospital, my aunt and uncle in tears and, and many of us just stunned at what had happened. The doctors came and talked to my aunt and uncle and told them that they didn't expect her to survive. They'd be lucky if she'd made it through the week. She was effectively brain dead and not moving, not doing anything. She was in a coma, an induced coma. Um, so it wasn't a pretty picture. And all of us are sitting in the emergency room, waiting room, just talking one another, wondering what's going on. Because we, have, all of us, every single one of us, have been praying for her for such a long time to come back to Christ. And we just didn't understand why this was going on. And it was a really hard situation to be in. There was very little hope at that moment, at least it so seemed. Well, I'll come back to this story as we get a little bit into God's Word tonight, but this story that we're going to look at tonight is close to home for me because of this reason, and for many of us it is that have gone through difficult trials. When the whole world seems to be falling apart, how do we deal with it? So, if you have your Bibles, feel free to open up to the book of Job, chapter 1. We're going to look at the oldest book in the Bible. As you'll see, this issue of hope and, and dealing with why do bad things happen to good people and all that is a question that's the oldest time itself. And we're going to be looking at it at the very beginning of the oldest book in the Bible. I'll read along, but you're welcome to check online if you need to follow the verses. Job chapter 1 starting in verse 13, reading to the end of the chapter. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their older brother's house, and there came a messenger to Job. Job is a rich man with a big family and lots of good things, and he is having just an every other day. But on this day, things don't go so well. The messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabines fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have come and escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of that house. And it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I have come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job did not sin, or charge God with wrong. Wow. Um, I don't know about you, but my first reaction, if I lose everything I have, I don't know if it's going to be to worship God. But yet, here's a man who has much and has lost literally everything. All his children, all his wealth, his servants, everything is gone. And he has nothing left. And yet his first reaction to say, God is good. How is he able to do this? What's going on in this guy's life that he could find hope in the midst of all of this junk that is going on in his life? Well, the book of Job is long, so I'm not going to sit here and read all 40 plus chapters to you. Instead, I'll summarize what happens to Job in his life so you can get a picture of this circumstances that he is going through. As the story continues on, Job not only loses everything, he becomes physically ill, boils all over his body. He is somebody nobody wants to be around anymore. His friends have left him. 
his wife tells him to just curse God and die. He ends up getting some really bad advice from three so-called friends that come and basically tell him, what have you done that is so bad that God would do all this horrible stuff to you? This is bad advice. But despite all that's going on around him, Job does not say God is evil or God is bad in all of this, though he does try to defend himself to his friends. Well, finally along in the story comes a, third, a fourth friend by the name of Elihu. Elihu comes to him and says, look, y'all got to stop talking about all this junk. You don't have a clue what you are talking about. It's, this isn't about you. This is about God, guys. He tells off the three friends that have been spouting all kinds of nonsense. And he gets on to Job, too, for constantly trying to show that there's nothing wrong with him. As Job is continually trying to defend himself and saying, there's no reason for all this bad to come on me. I'm a good moral person. He doesn't curse God, but he does make that distinction. Elihu points out a few things to him. First of all, he points out that Job is not a perfect person. And who is he to speak for God? God, whose ways are so much higher than his, whose knowledge is so much greater than his. Stop focusing on yourself and start looking at God. He points out a couple of things about the suffering. Elihu informs Job and lets him know that suffering is actually a good thing and can be a blessing from God. Suffering provides the sufferer with an opportunity to realize God's love and forgiveness when he is well again, understanding that God has ransomed him from an impending death. God speaks through difficulty sometimes, as well as primarily through his word. After Elihu finishes speaking, God himself shows up in a storm to Job. And he and God have a little come-to-Jesus meeting, as my mother used to like to say, which, if you guys know what that idiom means, it refers to someone really letting them know where they stand, putting someone in their place, getting in their face a little bit. So God speaks to Job. This is coming from Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut the sea with the doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set the bars on doors and said, Thus for shall you come and no farther, and here shall you prove waves be stayed, your proud waves be stayed. Point being, God's letting Job know who he is and putting Job in his place. Job wasn't there. Job didn't create the world. Job doesn't take care of the birds and make sure they are fed. Job doesn't keep the seas at bay or the skies separate. Job doesn't do any of these things. This is all from God. Well, after Job has this literal come to Jesus meeting in this instance, he prostrates himself and he recognizes God. He repents and asks for forgiveness from God. And he admits that God is higher than him, his ways higher than his ways, his thoughts higher than his thoughts. And when he chooses to honor God in all of this, ultimately God restores him. Not only does he restore his health, he restores his wealth and gives him twice what he had before, both double the children and double the goods. And ultimately, Job's story concludes. Well, Job didn't know it, but his life had a much bigger impact than he will ever know. So, let me finish the story of my cousin, whose life had a bigger impact than many would expect. 
So my cousin is, or was, in the ICU. She's in a coma. For over a month, we waited, not knowing if she was going to live or die the next day, always waiting for that moment. We were told that because of the rupture in her intestine, she was only left with four feet of intestine, far less than a human should have and be able to survive on for nutritional gain. We knew that there were going to be a lot of medical issues, even if she came out of it. But you know what? We had seen God working, and even though we didn't understand why this was happening because of how God had worked in our own lives, we trusted Him with how He could work now. Whether she lived or died, we are going to give glory to God, and we prayed for her day in and day out. And not because of us, but because of God, something miraculous did happen. While she was in her coma, God came to her. And these are from her own lips, not from ours though I am retelling the story, she said God came to her and God gave her two choices. He said, one, we can end it here. You can continue to live for yourself and I'm just going to let you pass on. Or two, you can choose to live for me and have renewed life. Well, clearly Mandy chose that it was about time for her to come to know God personal. And so she ultimately gave her life to him and he restored her. She came out of that coma she came back to us, and she is with us even today. Now, don't get me wrong, she has a lot of medical issues. And quite frankly, we didn't know if she was going to survive that first year, even though she recovered. She does only have four feet of intestine. She has to get TPN transfusions regularly, which is a form of nutritional supplement that has to be injected directly into her body. She's nowhere near as physically strong as she used to be. And after a while of walking around, she gets tired quite easily. I think a lot of people looking at her without knowing her would say, that's no way to live. That that's a really poor life compared to what she had before. She was a normal health. She could get, get around, do what she wanted. But now she is limited. She has to eat quite often because she can't retain the nutrients in her body. She has a lot of issues. She's often in the hospital still sometimes if she gets an infection. She can't just stay at home with the cold. She has to go to the hospital and they have to work on her a little bit because of her weakness. But even though she is physically weak, if you spend 10 minutes for her, you will learn very, very quickly that she is very much full of life. She has a renewed spirit. She is no longer who she was. Her character is completely different. You will be hard-pressed to find somebody more joyful and who laughs and jokes, who enjoys being around people, trying new things, getting out as much as she can. She loves life. And through her, many people have learned to look at life in a very different way because they see her, someone who should be sad and suffering, but is not at all, is joyful and full of life. Because of her experience, too, through her testimony sharing with others, other people have come to know the joy that she found in Jesus, too. Just like Bandy, who didn't have a clue how God was going to be working in her life, Job didn't know either. Job had no idea that the oldest book in the Bible would be written about his life, that people would be reading his stories thousands and thousands of years after he had passed. He had no idea the impact of the suffering that he experienced would ultimately paint a picture for people to find hope in Jesus today. It's a completely different mindset and helps us understand, even while we are going through difficult times, how God has a much bigger picture in store for all of us. So that does bring us to the question, okay, I see how God worked in Job's life. I can see how he worked in Mandy's life. But what does that have to do with me? I'm dealing with a pandemic. I'm dealing with viruses. I don't know if anybody's infected around me. Maybe I've even seen family members suffer or even lose some. Where is there to be hope in that? Well, it's very easy for us to get caught up in the moment and say, God doesn't care or God doesn't exist because there is evil. We are always watching the nightly news here, and I do enjoy it. I think there's a lot of good things that come out of the world news, but 
I have, we have a saying here at the house that we've said for a long time, and I think it's a very, very true saying. You are what you eat. What you put into your body is ultimately what's going to come out of that. Well, what are you talking about? Obviously, if we're talking about athletic body, if you get a lot of Twinkies and fried food, you're not going to be on the local sports team. You're not going to have an athletic body. You're not putting good nutritional things into your body, and it ultimately hurts you. If you're going to be an athlete, you need to eat healthy things to help your body. Well, the same is true for our minds and our souls. We need to be putting in healthy things, and if we're putting in a lot of junk, junk's going to come out. What I mean by that is this. If we're only ever watching the news, seeing how the world is worsening, the climbing death toll, we're seeing testimonies of anguish and, and depression in so many people, then we too will ultimately become depressed. It will affect us. It affects our minds and our bodies. If we're constantly scouring Reddit for the ideas of people that know what they're talking about, which they don't, there's a lot of dumb ideas. <laughs> then we start to delve into those morals, and we make those morals our own. And those are not peer-reviewed sources at all. It, lots of fake news that are found on social media. If we're looking at Facebook and Instagram, or even of those who are used to using Snapchat or TikTok, any of those things, and we're looking at the great lives and the fun and all the things that people are doing, and then we start to compare that to our own lives, and we start to feel depressed because we don't see how our lives reflect what other people are doing or what other people are seeing. All of those things affect our minds and our bodies. So you are what you eat. What you put in matters. So instead of putting in those things that lead to despair, that take away from your hope, Look for those things that can give you hope. Ultimately, that hope for all of us can come from Jesus, that can come from God's Word and who He is. No matter where you are in your life, there is hope to be found in Him. And what I mean is by this, if you grew up in a Christian community, there's a verse that many people hear a lot. And even if you're not a Christian, you may have heard somebody say this before. It comes from a book of Jeremiah. Chapter 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Well, that's quite refreshing. God's going to take care of us. He knows what's in store for us. He's going to have a future for us that is good, not anything evil. He has a future for us. He has hope for us. Well, a lot of people like to say that verse, but they forget the context of which it's being said. You see, Jeremiah is a prophet. A prophet is a person in the Old, table, the Old Testament that would go to people and tell them about what God had to say. Because, well, there wasn't a printing press on the short end of things. And he would tell them. But during Jeremiah's time, people were far from God. They didn't want to listen to God. They didn't care about God. Their lives were great. They were doing to do exactly what they wanted. They, anything that they saw good in their eyes, they would do it, no matter what the moral spectrum was. They just did what they liked. Jeremiah was one of the few people that honored God, and he went to warn them. Most of the book of Jeremiah is a warning, telling the people that there is going to be some discipline coming. There's some trouble coming, and if you guys don't turn around, it's going to be bad. He was ultimately speaking about the Babylonians, a group of bad guys that were going to come into Israel ultimately capture all the people and take them off into exile, into a foreign land that is not their own, where they would be servants and in some really bad times. Well, despite that this is about to happen, God comes and he says to his people, I still have plans for you. There is still hope in the future. This is not the end. So don't lose hope. Instead, turn to me and know that it's going to be okay. When you look at that and you say, if God is good, why is he letting that happen? That makes no sense whatsoever. Well, just like a parent, a good father or a good mother sometimes have to discipline their children. So too does God have to discipline his people and people around the world so they can recognize their need for him. What good is it if you gain the whole world yet lose your soul? What good is it if you have everything, riches, and all the comforts of this world, 
when ultimately we're all going to die and we can't take any of that with us. And when we die, ultimately, we're either with God or we're without God. And eternity lasts a lot longer than the hundred years most people are on earth. A lot, a lot longer, as you can probably guess. Let's look at the book of James real quick. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. Here it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire which it has conceived gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The Bible, not only in James, but throughout, is very clear, guys. God does not do bad things to people. God does not bring hurt and despair upon people. Only good things come from God. No, the evils of the world ultimately come from us. When we give in to our own desires, when we choose to not listen to God and try to do things our own way. And sometimes, God lets it happen. Just like a child who doesn't want to learn the easy way. They have to learn the hard way. Maybe they're told time and time again, don't play with that vase. It's going to break. Don't kick the ball in the house. Don't put your hand on the stove. It's hot. But they're hard-headed and they don't want to listen. The parents warn them over and over, but ultimately they do it anyways. And they have to learn from what many people call natural consequences. Well, the same is true for us. Naturally, we're all sinners, and sin just means going against God, turning away from Him. Well, we all choose to do our things our own way. We all choose to say, I know more about what I'm doing than you know, God. And sometimes God lets it happen, and we have to learn through natural consequences and through difficulty and strife. But that's not the way it's meant to be, guys. That's not the way God wants it to be. He wants us to know that He's there for us whenever we want Him, that He's willing to bring us out of it whenever we're willing. That doesn't mean we won't suffer in this life, but it does mean we can have that hope in a future that he has in store for us. God is good, and he wants us to know him. So what do we do with that information? We know that God has been good in the past. We can see it through the Bible. We recognize in our own lives that we tend to focus too much on the day-to-day -day and not focus on what God has in store for us as Christians. Or as non-Christians, we're looking for hope, and we're looking for something dif different in the midst of all this stuff that's going on. Scared of getting sick, and scared of dying, because at the end, we have no control over death. Well, there's two answers to that. Really, one answer, but two different responses to that answer. The first answer is recognizing that through suffering, God is helping us to recognize our need for Him. That we are not in control. We don't have control of it all. We don't have any way to handle what's going on. We need help. And God is that help. And secondly, to respond to that. To come closer to Him. To draw close to the one who can help us. So if you're a Christian, that response means drawing close to God. Delving into His Word. Get off social media so much. I'm not saying go away from it and never use it. Just... Don't focus on it so much. Instead, make sure you're taking time every single day for that nourishment that your soul needs. Get into God's Word. Get closer to Him. Focus on it because you are what you eat. If you're intaking God's Word day by day, then the worries and scares of the world are not going to impact you because you'll know where your hope is. Don't forget what God has done for you in the past. Journal if you need to. Remember the things that God has done. So when bad things happen in the future, you can recall those events the way God was faithful and took care of you. And you can remember that. And memorize His Scripture. Know His promises. Remember Revelations, how it ends. You don't have to be fearful because the victory is already won. God's already done it for you. But He wants you to be a part of it. Secondly, for non-Christians, like I just said, God wants you to be a part of it. If you don't know Christ today, guys, then 
that call is not to delve into his word. God's calling you to himself. He wants you to know him. It doesn't do you any good to know all about God if you don't have a relationship with God. And that, first and foremost, is the most important thing. God talks about a tree and a vine. He says he is the tree, he is the vine, and we are the branch. Without the tree, without the vine, the branch withers and dies. But God is the great gardener, and he can take that branch and he can put it back on the tree. He can put it back on the vine so that you can have life again. If you want to have that life, if you want to have that hope in Jesus, you can today. You don't have to wait, guys. In the book of Romans 3.23, it tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, guys. We're all sinners. Doesn't matter if you've gone to church every day of your life. Doesn't matter if you're a morally upstanding person. Maybe you haven't been. Maybe you have been like my cousin and you've gone far from God. You've gone down a bad path and you recognize your sin. But don't think yourself smart like Job. Don't think yourself perfect. Recognize that every single one of us has done bad things. And if you don't think you have, let's look at the Ten Commandments, right? Ten Commandments says, don't commit murder. Do not murder. Well, I haven't killed anybody. Yet Jesus tells us, if we have hate in our heart towards someone, it's as though as we've killed them. God says, don't commit adultery. Well, I've never cheated on my wife. I've never cheated on my girlfriend. God tells us, if you even have lust in your heart, it is though you have committed adultery. That means looking at a woman wrongfully, pornography, any of those things is committing adultery. God's standard is way higher than our standard, guys. And we need him because we can't match that standard. There's no way on earth. We have no ability to do it. We need him. So if you recognize you've sinned, then also recognize the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our sort, our Lord. If we walk down the path of sin, if we choose to walk away from God, it'll be nice for a while. A flower doesn't wither in a day. It takes a few days, but ultimately, if it isn't connected to a source of nutrients, it will die, and the same is true for us. If you continue down that road, it's eternal death, guys. That's not what God wants. That's not what we want for you. So recognize, though, you don't have to do that. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we are still sinners, even while you are spitting in God's face or walking away from him, he, Jesus came to this world to die for you. He died on that cross. He paid that price so that you can be reconnected with God. It's a free gift. It's a free gift that he wants to give you. But there's one thing that has to happen with the free gift on Christmas or any other day or a birthday, right? You have to choose to receive that gift. You have to choose to accept that from God. The Bible tells us that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believed and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess are and saved, guys. If you do not know Christ, if you do not have a relationship with him, you don't have to wait till you've got it all right. You don't have to wait until you understand all the answers. You don't have to wait until you're no longer sinning because that day is not going to come. God wants you to know he's already done all the hard work. He's given you the gift. He wants you to be a part of his family. And so you can accept that today. If you want to accept that today, then I would say to you, just pray to God. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And you, at this moment, can be saved. If you want to do that, then I would say pray a prayer with me. I'm going to say a prayer, and I just want you to repeat those words along with me. It's not those words that save. Words don't mean. It's the belief in your heart, the faith in Jesus, and his great love for you that leads to salvation. So, if you want to know Christ today, then pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I know I am a sinner. I know my sin deserves to be punished, Lord. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for me and rose from the grave. I want to turn from my sin and trust Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for everlasting life and forgiveness that I can now have through faith in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.
The Bible tells us, For who shall ever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you have made that prayer today, if you have made that confession, and you meant it with all your heart, you're not just saying words, but you truly cry out to God, you will be saved. God saves you right now. Not down the week, not tomorrow, now. You can know you have faith in Jesus. If you made that confession, then I would ask that you write down this time, you write down this date, and you take a moment to tell those around you that you have made that statement of faith, that you want and have chosen to believe in Jesus Christ. If you're a part of a church, then please contact your pastor or someone to speak with, that they can lead you along this route. As we're online, obviously, I wish I could come to you in person, but I can't. If you do not have a church, if you do not have people around you that you can connect with, then please stay on and connect with one of us that we can talk with you and help you and hopefully help guide you to a local church as well that you can delve into. God wants you to have hope, even in the midst of difficulty. God wants you to know that He is in control and He loves you very, very much. You are loved. Jesus cares about you. And it is through Him that even in times like this, we can have hope in Jesus.